it's interesting to me the times that we see how people respond to oh circumstance life tragedy death happiness joy getting a job or getting prosperity having bad news delivered winning a lottery each and every one of us we all seem to have our own way of responding to things that happen in our life normal responses you know some people say are normal you know they would say well if you get a lottery ticket and you're the winning number oh boy oh boy you know <laughs> not me but most people would be thrilled to death to see you know the winning lottery ticket you know and they go oh yeah cool and they get all excited about it because they have these plans of what they're going to do you know or or like you know they they can put some money away for retirement or put some money away for their children's education you know all these things that they can do because now they have the money to do them and that's a good response you know it's, it's nice to sit down and to plan and to coordinate our plans because God said that the direction of a man's heart is his own but the footsteps are ordered of the Lord so we can choose to a certain degree the direction we want to go a certain amount of life is in that choice you know a person will decide you know they want to be a police officer or they want to be a soldier or they want to be a tinker a trader a baker a butcher a candlestick maker or they want to be you know an Indian chief they want to go to war or stay out of war they want to be a pastor or a missionary they want to be in the ministry or they want to sing or worship you know a lot of directions that we decide for ourselves God lets us decide for ourselves even though we may choose a direction God may choose the profession that we are called to rather than the obsession of the direction that we want to go to in other words somebody could be a, a doctor that's a nice profession, you know, it's like, okay, you know, heal people. But God may have called him to be a pastor. Well, there is a conflict of interest, because being a, a pastor involves a lot of time and energy. But being a doctor does the same. You see, there's a certain amount of ways and means that God can use one to bring about the other. And sometimes that happens in some of the circumstances in our life. God will let us choose what we want to do but then in the midst of doing that he may call us unto what he really wanted for us in the first place sometimes that happens in big revival meetings or big evangelistic crusades you know people people always want big you know they think bigger is better they think somehow God is there because there's lots of people and they're all aware and they're all worshiping together and that's not really true because the blunt fact of it is that most of the time when you find a huge group of people gathered together you find a crowd that can easily turn into a mob and most of the time as we look in scripture you don't find the faithfulness of great numbers of people you find their faithlessness because less is more in God's economy those intimate relationships that God wants to establish with us doesn't happen in the mass media or the mass collective consciousness of a crowd mentality it operates in the individuality of a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God me and God you and God together we form you know a tri trinity so to speak you me and God and that's what happens in marriage too same thing is husband wife and God it's not husband wife family God it's husband wife God and then after that it may be you know father son God or mother son God or whatever it may be but the individuality of the perspective of God saying one which is what he is hero Israel the Lord our God the Lord is one was always meant to be one to one even as the son talks to the father one to one and the spirit talks to the son one to one and together they all talk to each other one to one and in that perspective of unity of the oneness of God we also find the fact of how God operates in our lives one-to-one -one. it's not about all the 
masses of appeals or tools that we think we are going to use like some massive revival now you know i i'm all for revivals don't get me wrong you know i i look at revivals and i see you know ten thousand people come forward you know and by golly you know i see you know ten thousand come forward you know and some of them came down and went back up into the stands right where they belonged you know because they partially went down with their friends you know to help them to get confident and then they went back up you know and i like the numbers that people say you know oh well millions got saved you know and you add them up and you kind of go Ooh, wow the whole world saved you know <laughs> well yeah. not so much but god can use the direction a person chooses by eventually causing the reflection of his glory to accomplish his purpose on the ways and means he chooses to bring that person to himself you see a person may start off by going to a crusade they may go to 12 crusades because they may get saved over and over and over again and there are lots of people in america that are getting saved over and over and over again so whenever you hear these ministry numbers you know or you see these great revivals don't get too excited don't get too wound up you know you may see them at church for maybe a week or two but after that hey you know eventually you know they're heading down the road you know they got busier things to do okay i got my salvation i'm gone okay i can see what kind of salvation that was it had a big impact on your life you denied yourself take up your cross and follow jesus right well no i got saved and i went on my own way ah so by grace you're saved so that way you just went off to do your own thing and sometimes that's what happens in great revivals or great evangelistic crusades people get wound up with unrealistic expectations you know superlatives that we use in religion to qualify and quantify the effectiveness of a ministry by somehow establishing it oh if it's bigger it's better if it's thousands of people came to the Lord you know and they all you know took a Bible and they got their tracks you know and they got their acts you know and they're all kind of like you know sending in their first responders card and then there's no second responder or third or fourth in the years that exist we see in Christendom interesting perspective there's the story of people like Billy Sunday um, Moody Spurgeon a bunch of these different great evangelists at the turn of the century and I'm not going to say which one because it's better that you research on your own in order to determine which ones were which but there was once a great evangelist and he was wonderful he told beautiful stories people would cry in an instant at his stories in an evangelistic crusade and they would all come forward I mean just without a doubt almost every seat was vacated you know they'd come down and dedicate their lives to God until the next week and then the next week they were back to doing the same old thing they were back into the world and its ways they had the great emotional response but they had no devotional connection they were given the great call to come but they weren't followed up with any kind of discipleship from the one they didn't have that personal connection with God they had a personal connection with the evangelist don't get me wrong that was powerful I mean even today we look back on his work and we think wow what awesome teaching what magnificent oratory what wonderful and powerful man of God this was but as we see the they call it the recivity I can't re re I can't think of the word it begins with an R but the actual people that stayed with being a Christian as opposed to the ones that made a commitment and then split you know it's like really low really actually kind of like 20% you know maybe 10% and it was really actually kind of sad when you read about it because you go huh well, that's a shock but then you read about this other person who really isn't all that well known for being an evangelist and really didn't have these huge giant revivals these great crusades these magnificent powerful oratory statements or stories and yet he constantly was able to build a type of ministry that talked to people where they were at it kind of connected with them it was lesser well known lesser popular at the time and yet the 
continuation of those people that made declarations of following Jesus or making a dedication of their life to follow God was almost in the 90 percentile group. Interesting that there would be that big a disparity between what was so obviously, oh, a great man of God, <gasps> and yet less than 10 percent within a year had fallen away. And yet somebody who wasn't so great or well-established or well-known in that capacity, 90 <gasps> percent, what's he doing right? And you know, you read it and you go, well, yeah, it's good, not as great as this great oratory, this wonderful, magnificent person over here, but yet God used this person to touch the individuals. Because you see, that's where it really is at in revivals or supposed crusades or any kind of meeting or conference that you go to or some kind of work of religion that isn't, um, well, let's just say, there are a lot of things in religion that aren't necessarily works of the spirit, but they are works of tradition. You know, is that a church will get caught up into kind of a traditional thing because it, you know, it seems like the right thing to do. And a direction of a man's heart, after all, is his own, but the footsteps are order of the Lord. So the Lord kind of blesses it because he's going to use it in some way, maybe not the way that the people that started it intended, but by the way that he chooses to use anyways, despite the name that's on top of what the direction of a person's heart is. And that's how God kind of works in our lives, too, is that sometimes we think we're going in one direction when God is really doing something else in that direction because he's got us moving, now he can use us. So that in that direction, even though we're going that way, he's really using us in a different way. Sometimes that's like, you know, football players that have a testimony, you know what I mean? Don't get me wrong. Uh, you know, me personally, I wouldn't be caught dead working sports, you know, but that's some people's desire, you know, they grow up wanting to be a great, you know, hero of sports and... You know, God bless them, you know, if that's what God wants you to do, okay, fine, you know, but most of them usually don't want to know what God wants them to do, they do it, and then they got God in it, and then they can give God glory for it. Which is, you know, God uses it as he chooses. God may never remember their football career at all, but he'll remember what they did, even though they were a football player. That's the way I look at it. Maybe I'm wrong, or maybe I'm right. <laughs> and that's kind of what he does with religious ideas. A religious idea is often called a dogma, or a doctrine, or in this case, a tradition, or a... I don't, I don't even know what we would call it, a practice, yeah, a religious practice. A religious practice would be something like a revival meeting. You know, I never understood the revival meeting, but, you know, I, I get it. You know, I mean, I know that there were tents around times, and then it goes all the way back to, you know, the centuries when they were traveling around. The only way that they could study the Bible because the Bible was not in mass production was that they had these troubadours that were going around. They were doing demonstrations of plays, and they were doing these little sermonettes as acts of plays, you know, and they would do that. And it was kind of like, you know, the thing that was being demonstrated in a real-life way to the people so that they would learn it and that they would begin to understand what the Scriptures said and what Jesus said because that was the way that they talked was that they were hearing rather than reading the Word of God because most people couldn't read in those days in Europe, in the Dark Ages. So, you know, I kind of understand, you know, the revival stuff and the tent meetings and all the other things that come about. You know, we use, you know, it's like the gifts of the Spirit. Some people say, oh, well, you know, let's go get to a healing ministry. A healing ministry. Interesting. Yeah, okay, I got it. God can't heal, but the healing ministry can. Or let's go to a deliverance ministry. You know, it's like, well, okay, you know. God can't deliver, but a deliverance ministry can. You see, it's kind of foolish in some way, some of the things that we say or some of the things that we make up by our religious practices. But in reality, you know, it's just God. It's one-to-one. -one. You want to be delivered? Ask God. That's simple. You're delivered. You want to be healed? Ask God. Simple. He heals you. If you want to be led by God, ask God. He'll lead you. I mean, it boils down to really kind of a simple thing if you want to be like a little child and get past the religious practices. But... Sometimes people in religion have to have these traditions and practices so that they kind of feel good about it because sometimes they do need, like those 10% in the big giant crowds, they need to have 10,000 other people around so they could be the one person that gets saved going down there with all 10,000 others that you know ran forward in order to rededicate or dedicate their life to God. Hallelujah, brother. Amen. God bless you. But Really, it's here. It doesn't matter if you go down, make some profession, or you make a confession from here to there. 
because God is where you are. He listens and he's more attentive to the person and the individual that gets saved by calling on him than he is about all those that make the profession of some confession in the midst of some giant religious practice. Raul Reese made a statement about his personal testimony that on the day that he was going to blow his wife away, a man came on television, gave a message, and Raul Reese was changed from that moment on. At the point in time that was happening, he was sitting there with a shotgun, waiting to blow his wife away, I guess, and then blow himself away when she walked in the door. God chose not to use a giant, you know, evangelistic crusade of some type, you know, to get to Raw, but rather spoke to Raw, period, one to one. Through the avenue of a man, it's true, but also later through direct interaction with Raw. And he does that with everyone. Every one of us, even in the midst of a giant revival, a giant crusade, a big religious practice, some big church you might be attending, get talked to one to one. It's not numbers, it's oneness. It's the one God we are looking to and seeking to follow. Now, the way we do that is through the one Son, Jesus, that he has by way of his one spirit that is one with God, you know, and that's Father, Son, and Spirit. So, you know, it kind of all boils down to the one. But the point I'm trying to make is don't get caught up or lost in or confused about religious practices. They are there and they will be used lots of times to accomplish lots of things the people that are practicing it think they are going to accomplish. But God underneath that religious practice is doing a whole different work that if he even told us what was going on, we would be amazed at how he operates according to his spirit, according to his will, and according to his way. Sensitive to religion but living like the devil. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? Luke 18.8 In our day, we can find plenty of men and women in all walks of life who live like the devil while insisting that they are sensitive to religion. If an evangelist sweeps through and the excitement gets big enough, they'll go to the meeting and swell the crowds and contribute to the offering. And it will look big. They'll even make a profession of faith. But here's the catch. After it's all over, the moral standards of the community are right where they were before. Nothing changed neither did the person. I contend that whatever does not raise the moral standard and consciousness of the church or community has not been a revival from God. The God that men believe in now and to whom they are sensitive to is a kind of divine pan with a pipe who plays lovely music when they dance and while they dance they enjoy it but he is not a God that makes any moral demands upon them. Oh. God's got a wonderful plan for your life. You don't have to give up anything, but just go get it. Just be aware that there's a purpose for your life, that God has a purpose, and you don't have to do anything about your life. Just go find your purpose. God has a design for you to fit into, and that design and pattern is perfect for your life. So until when you get done playing around, go find that purpose and design in life, and you will enjoy it. I still say that any revival that will come to a nation and leave people as much in love with money as they were before and as engrossed in human pleasure is a snare and a delusion. True faith in God, not in any God, not in religion, but faith in the sovereign God who made heaven and earth and who will require of men men's deeds, that is the God we must believe in, my friends. Believing in Him, we will seek to crucify our flesh and put on the new man which is renewed in holiness. That kind of faith in God alone is all but gone. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? There's often, and this is Tozer that's speaking by the way, Tozer, day by day. Tozer reminded us, because he exists in our day, that the evangelical perspective of wanting to make and reach out to the humanity and the masses out there was so great that at times people 
didn't make it hard or require anything but that grace somehow would always change a person's life for the good. And that no matter what we said or did, if we would just give the simple gospel, then great. The person, the people, the places, the things would change because the person would change based upon the love and the grace that they received. And you know, to a certain degree, that's true. I mean, I personally share a video study, Bible study, about video grace, about how grace changes things. And the balance of grace and judgment and how God still extends grace and that we're sin abounds, grace much more abounds, but also the results of the consequences of refusing or God watching and seeing if we abuse the grace we've been given because there is the abuse of grace. And that's what Tozer was talking about. There's, there's that. If you aren't recognizing and realizing that there's a requirement of you to change and to allow God to change you and you're refusing that change that he's working out in you, then the question that theologian, theologians have is were you saved in the first place because you're resisting the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And the Holy Spirit has said in the word, I will not always strive with man. So at some point in time, God doesn't go beyond a place where you have hardened your heart to the extent that God no longer wants to deal with you, but he leaves you to your own direction and your own footsteps. And that's where the danger lies in choosing not to listen and obey what the Lord is telling you to do today. You have to respond to and yield yourself to the move of the Spirit, to God's work in your life, to demonstrate the fact that God is in your life. Because he promised if you would try, he would do the rest. If you aren't trying, you aren't saved. If you're not responding, you aren't saved. If you aren't in some way demonstrating the fact that there is a seed of the Word of God inside you growing and germinating and gradually putting down roots into your soul and into your flesh, tendrils that are beginning to cause to suck out the life of your flesh but to build up this soul inside you and that little tiny seed of the Spirit of God is growing and germinating and becoming gradually ready to spring forth outside of your physical manifestation to those around you by the peace, the love, the joy, the weakness, the kindness, temperance, gentleness, fruits of the Spirit, all that God has placed inside you, then I dare say that the seed has fallen unto the soil that possibly maybe roots were, you know, like weeds were with them and the roots were choked up. Not good soil or that the seed of the Word of God that was placed in you has been trampled upon by the feet of men because you didn't protect it in the first place, so you start again. Or that you yourself have taken that seed and removed it far from your life by demonstrating that you don't want God in your life. You see, there has to be an attitude of the heart change. Not necessarily outward manifestation, because some people confuse the two. I understand that you know everyone wants to see you, you know, be perfect, but really the perfection is inside, not outside. God is perfecting you from the inside out, not from the outside in. And though there may be those demonstrations of religious practice from the outside, what happens on the inside will prove whether you were saved or not. Now, if you don't want to be saved, go to hell. I mean, that's the bottom line, is that the fact that so many people choose to somehow adapt this place that God has reserved for angels, which, you know, that should automatically explain, you're not supposed to be there. It was designed for angels. And that God has said, I've done everything I need to do in order to prevent you from going there. Don't go there. And here's how. And that you refuse to. It kind of goes without saying, if you really want to go there, you go there. You're gonna. You know, it's not just, you know, good and bad. That's not how God's evaluating you. He's evaluating, are you perfect? If not, you can't exist in a perfect environment. You are the corruption. You are the weed. You'll be pulled out. But he wants you to make you not the weed, but the seed. So if you're a weed, you're going you know, to hell. If you're a seed, you're going to grow up into the planting, the fruit, the tree, the, the flower, <laughs> for some of you. <laughs> but, you know, 
you're going to grow up into that which the seed God has planted causes you to grow up into. So the choice of being a we or a seed or growing or knowing or having God finally fully develop you technically is yours. You see, he's done everything he can. He wants you to just try and let him. In other words, you don't stop the work of God. God's always going to do what he's going to do. I mean, there's nothing that you can do that can stop him. He's going to always work on you. He's going to chase you, pursue you like we talk about the hounds of heaven. Grace and mercy will chase you and pursue you all the days of your life until you turn again you know, to the Lord your God and love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and serve Jesus with your life, you know, giving to him again the control of your life. And at times you may you know, take it back and you know, play games. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a hardening of your heart that you have heard God speak. You have responded to the call. You have known in your heart that God is wanting your all and you're resisting and pulling back until finally one day the Spirit of God does say to you, I will not strive anymore because as a weed, you'll become a weed. Choose to have your nature changed. Choose not to follow after the religious practices of some that, you know, on the one hand, they look like they got saved, but on the other hand, nothing has changed. They're still rocking out they're still doing their thing. They're still sinning as much as they ever were. And yet they're covering it with a religious practice as opposed to living it with a religious observance. You see, every religious observance can be observed from the inside out, but a religious practice you can only see from the outside in. Yeah.